here we go. It's very hot today. I've got the fan on. I'm going to see how this works. Uh, during the nap in, the, the wind was quite strong, but somehow <clears throat> the microphone didn't mess up, right? I mean, it didn't interfere too much with the video, so hopefully that fan in the background is not going to make a difference here. And I can just flit nap and talk without worrying about that. Hopefully. I'll review the video. But I'll, you know, 99% chance I'll post it no matter what happens. I used to be quite picky about what I uploaded. But I'm not that picky anymore. I took a little bit too much off there with that overshot. Yes, indeed. But it's all right. Let's see. I got that preform from last night. I've got the uh, little practice point. I'm going to try to do the same with this piece. This is a higher quality Georgetown than this one. Generally, if you don't know, the lighter colors tend to be better in Georgetown. Uh, some people also call it Edwards Chert, right? Uh, there's different grades of Georgetown, in case you don't know. Uh, for you guys who know, just bear with me for a minute. The, uh, the chalky stuff. You can actually rub off the chalk on the outside extremely easily on this on that Georgetown stuff is actually true flint. The stuff that has this kind of rind or uh, limestone-ish looking cortex, it's either river tumbled, so it's ground off by natural forces, or it is a limestone-based chert which is a lesser quality in most cases but it's still considered the same formation but it's a lesser quality sometimes people call it uh, Edwards Chert instead of the Georgetown but it's pretty much the same thing right except for the the workability the chalkier the cortex the better the lighter the colors the better Although they don't always match, you know, the lighter colors don't always have the nice chalky cortex. It tends to be the opposite sometimes. I know that didn't make sense. It, it tends to be the opposite. All right. So now that you're thoroughly confused, let's continue. <laughs> I was reviewing my latest videos for inconsistencies, contradictions, and basically the annoying stuff. Uh, and please comment if you think it's confusing, annoying, or if it needs clarification, or if you don't care, you can say, I don't care. Don't ask me to comment on the, on the commentary because I don't care. I just want to see the flaky. Flaking is what I need for my fix. I don't care. I listen to Pink Floyd while I watch you nap. Okay. You can put that in the comments too. All right. I'm because I'm going to start rambling again, right? I reviewed my latest videos. The way I tend to ramble, I bring up exceptions. Like I'll say, well, what is the answer to this question? I'll try to give an answer, but I also bring up exceptions. And sometimes the explanation sounds or is contradictory, right? I need to clarify. But I don't remember the mistakes I make because I'm napping too. Anyway, I'll bring up what contradicts a certain position 
because I think it's important to know what contradicts your position as well as what supports it and uh, the way I look at it and the way uh, philosophers of science some of them look at it is that the criticism gets us closer to the truth than the support for a certain argument now today's education system is the opposite they think the support is more valid or leads you to the truth in a more effective way than knowing the criticisms uh, that tends to be a general philosophy that you use in the courtroom because you have to defend your client or uh, if that's your if that's what you're doing or the prosecutor has to bring evidence in support of guilt so everything is done in support of the evidence is all in support of uh, there is contrary evidence too of course but for the most part the way I uh, from my experience and my anecdotes, I see mainly support for arguments presented in the courtroom. Is that system valid? Uh, it's, yeah, but it's valid only in the sense that it's meant as a vehicle to convince people. Especially if it's a jury or whatever if someone has to decide like a judge or a jury the evidence is meant to convince the attitude of the lawyers are meant or designed to convince and with human nature the way it is and with mental illness the way it is most people respond to support rather than criticism they hate criticism. They rather listen to arguments in support of instead of criticism. This criticism just sounds like whining in many cases. Whereas support can be lively, humorous, political. And overall appealing to emotion because you can bring anything in support pretty much you can uh, design your argument to use just about anything in support and if you have an objective what is my objective you can write down your objective and then assemble everything possible to support the final conclusion or objective. W ignoring or suppressing or distorting anything contradictory to that if it comes up. So you've got your list of supporting documents, arguments, then you have your list of criticisms and how you overcome those criticisms well, why am I saying all this because that mentality creeps into research archaeological research and other types of scientific research that type of mentality creeps into areas where it shouldn't be creeping into Now, it's, I have a long ways to go before I can clarify the way I speak and the way I write. So right now, I'm all over the place. But my goal is, in, uh, in the final analysis, my goal is to become more clear and more concerned with 
how to present criticisms in such a way that it doesn't sound whiny or polemic or just downright nasty so that the criticisms are not ignored because the way I see it the best the best tools for finding the truth are criticisms and this is not to say that supporting evidence is bad but if you know philosophy you if you know David Hume one of his rules is uh, support is weak I lost track of what I was thinking there uh, It doesn't matter how much support you have for something, it doesn't prove any, it doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it so. That's from David Hume back in the day. No amount of support can make it true. It doesn't make it true. Which is contrary to in, the intuitive way of thinking. You would say, yeah, if you have a lot of support, that kind of makes it true. No. Nope. It doesn't make it true. It just supports your thing. But it doesn't make it true. The, the truth is elusive. It's hard to find. And even when you find it, even if you think you're extremely close, sometimes it changes over time. Or changes, especially when you're dealing with life forms opinions something that's fluid it changes it's very difficult to nail down the truth in a chaotic or changing environment all right so my goal is to try and present thoughts and arguments with a critical mindset but make it so that it's not annoying as best I can why did I bring up David Hume well a lot of uh, modern philosophers like David Hume but often they don't take his advice They look to the other things that he said, but they ignore that no amount of support can make something true. They ignore that part. Okay. So what am I going to do with this piece? I'm trying to get it down to a regular biface regularize it uh, for this kind of point I did look it up the Wells point is a this is not a Wells point but the Wells point is middle archaic 3,000 to 4,000 years old I think it's very similar to this uh, I made another one of these sloths layered types, but this one has more of a Cody type stem to it. This one has more of a Wells type stem. With these sloth slayer points, uh, the bases are ground, right? And they're found, at least in one case, at the same depth as Clovis. So they're supposedly paleo. Right, Wells Point is mid archaic. Now, uh, the site where I saw these being 
pulled from is a site managed by a vocational archaeologist or collector not an not a um how should i say an institutional or university sponsored dig so take that with a grain of salt right um anyway the characteristics why i'm why i'm so interested in this because it has serrations on it that's the number one reason number two they're a real pain to make it's hard to get your mindset and your brain wrapped around it and those are the types of points i like uh, because it's just a challenge in that respect uh, well then why don't you do Folsom <laughs> well I already kind of went through that challenge already in the very beginning that was one of the first points that I I tried to make because it was extremely challenging and after I got to the if I after I made a few and I got it out of my system I just stopped with the same thing will happen with these once I have a few under my belt that look good and look correct, I'll probably stop. Anyway, the characteristics of the Sloth Slayer Point, as far as I can tell, are very regular flaking. Uh, up to the midpoint of the blade, stems are ground and narrow. This is a little bit too wide. This is about the this is about the right size, and they're flat, not rounded. Although I think some of them might be. I think most of the sloth slayer type points are straight at the base. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll make them straight, uh, similar to Cody, but not quite. So more narrow than this, but still evenly tapering. And very well made which means they're they're kind of thin all right so that's my goal I've got two preforms now I really don't have much time to be spending on this one but it's driving me up the wall I want to get it out of my system because I can't really focus on other points until I get this one down anyway Getting back to philosophy. No, please don't. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm going to go there again. I got on Twitter for a while, a few years back, or a couple years back. I don't know what it was. Just so I could learn uh, what people were doing on the political side of things. What are the arguments? What are the debates? Yada yada, I was excited. I'm going to get into the fray here and uh, learn what's being said from many different viewpoints, from many different people. This is going to be cool. All right, I can learn something from this. Oh, yeah, I learned something from it. All right. I'm, I'm lear I learned that there's some genius, crazy people out there. Why do I say genius? They are such geniuses with their insanity that they can create language and, and verbiage that spreads insanity like uh, a contagion. That's how genius they are. Evil genius, yes, but it's amazing how a disease can be spread through language. And yes, I said disease, because we're talking about mental, a mental disease. It seems to be an abusive language, which it is. So for days and months, uh, just l listening to the arguments would make my head hurt question my question my faith in humanity and generally make me making me feel sick 
mentally by listening to some of this stuff and reading what people were saying they were nutballs so yeah I did learn about politics but not the kind that I wanted to learn about I learned about the irrational actors their motivations their tactics their hangouts their way of speaking their avenues of power and uh, usurpation how can how do they infest I learned how people actually can infest organizations. Basically anything that employs language to spread knowledge, these people will infest those areas. Anything involving language and ideas and abstractions. Why do they infest these areas? Because it's been made easy it's been made easy by the internet by reinf by the way that they reinforce each other through echo chambers they're not think tanks they're they are not centralized it's almost like uh, flash mobs, but flash mobs for rhetoric. A topic comes up, they all flash into the topic, develop their rhetoric, and then disperse. You don't really know who they are, many of them are anonymous, but the rhetoric gets developed by this flash mob of these nutballs. And it's there, it, it, it remains there, but they are dispersed afterwards. It's hard to locate the centers of where is this coming from. And that's because it doesn't come from something centralized. It's an underlying condition of the mind. So that's what I learned. So instead of learning stuff like what is the best solution for this and this issue I learned things like if you don't su support this issue you are blah 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 well is it the best uh, if it's is it the best solution well it sounds like you don't like it so you you are part of the problem no, no, I'm asking if it's the best solution. I mean, really? Well, if you don't support it, you are against it. That sort of thing starts to go, starts to uh, creep in. And that sort of thing starts to creep into archaeology and lithic reduction and what, whatever we're doing here. with trying to learn not only how to do this but why and what is the correct procedure for research what's the best solution for questions I mean yeah what's the best solution for answering questions yada 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 Okay, so that's where I'm headed with that. I'm trying to avoid what I thought would be productive. I didn't really find anything productive when I explored the Twitter and social media arena, except for little bits of knowledge here and there. 
If it wasn't for the internet, I wouldn't be uh, as healthy as I am now because I learned that my diet was one of the main causes of my depression and anxiety and overall feeling of dread and melancholy and lack of physical strength, lack of ability to heal properly. Diet has a big thing, big, what is a big part of that. If it wasn't for the internet, I would, I would still be bloated, depressed. confused, suffering from early onset dementia, and the list goes on and on. So yeah, it's not all bad. And of course we can look up arrowheads and what their properties are. Who made them, and etc, etc. And all the supporting evidence, like the... Uh, this, this point here supposedly is a war point, right? But it's true that just because it looks like a war point or someone said it was, doesn't make it so. Doesn't make it, uh, doesn't make it a strong bit of evidence for the existence of war by itself. That's true. It doesn't. But if you have other evidence there's a lot of evidence for warfare in this particular area uh, well in most areas this is one of the last areas to be colonized in the United States right on the west coast there's plenty of evidence for warfare uh, there's uh, Let's see, it'll be too extensive to get into, right? But if you read books on cultures in California and those, in those areas, uh, there's all kinds of things on uh, ceremonies before war, uh, medicine, what they call medicine, or uh, items of power or things, or symbols of power, symbols of protection, symbols of all this stuff related to war. Uh, totems maybe uh, there's clothing war shirts uh, war paint uh, war dances war gods all this stuff related to war as evidence to suggest that warfare did take place and then when you have when you put this in with that that pool of evidence you start developing a culture what seems to be a culture with at least part of it devoted to war. So I'm not saying this by itself is going to prove war. The moral of the story is this is just one piece of the puzzle. This is one piece and it's been said that this is a war point so you know you kind of yeah it's plausible right it's, it's plausible. To prove it is a war point you would need a lot of burials that had this as cause of death cause of death burials are very strong evidence uh, but what is the counter evidence that this was not a war point well counter evidence that this was not a war point it's not that it's missing from the archaeological record it's not that we don't have cause of death but counter evidence would be this is mainly found in deer and rabbit remains or other other areas other sites other than burials that would suggest this was used for hunting like it's associated with deer remains or bison remains or fish remains or some other remains that are not human remains that would be counter evidence that it's not a war point uh, yeah, evidence against it being a war point if you find it with other remains. Now, the fact that you don't find this with human remains doesn't prove that it's not a war point. There was a lot of negatives in there. But you know what I mean. Okay, so 
this is another preform that I'm going to be using for the sloth slayer point. I think that's it. I should have it complete to where I want it. I'll offer them in the auction, you know, these and then whatever I make of these if they don't break them. All right, so that's it for this segment. I'm going to do a lot of work off camera because um, I apologize, but I, I really can't do my best work on camera. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video.